Squarespace makes it easy to create a unique website. You can blog, showcase your work, publish content, and even sell products and services of all kinds just with a few clicks. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code HISTORICAL to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Hi, I'm Vanessa Richardson. And I'm Carter Roy. Welcome to Historical Figures, formerly known as Remarkable Lives, Tragic Deaths. Every Wednesday, we discuss a different person's lasting historical impact, unique personality, and impression on the world around them. Our audio biographies cover big lives, but we like to focus on little-known facts. If you want to listen to any previous episodes, you can find them on your favorite podcast directory. And while you're there, we'd really appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review. Today, we're taking a look at the life of George Horace Gallup, the journalist, psychologist, and advertiser who invented modern polling. Polling? As in the Gallup poll? Ah. So he's the guy who started all these predictions about who will win an election. Yes, but he wouldn't have described it that way. Polling has never been just about elections. It has implications for products, films, and culture. And living in a democracy in a time of rising fascism, he saw polling as a moral imperative. George Horace Gallup was born in the small town of Jefferson, Iowa, on November 18, 1901, to George Henry Gallup and Nettie Quella Gallup. His father, George Henry Gallup, was a dairy farmer who had a library of more than 1,000 books. When the younger George was two, his Aunt Julia speculated that he would turn out to be a slow child because he apparently didn't cry much. That seems like a bit of a leap. Did he hold a grudge against her? Apparently not. When he grew up, he named his daughter after her. Hmm. The younger George was quickly nicknamed Ted. There are a few competing stories about why. One contends that the family's nurse, Elsie, tried to get him to answer to Teddy because of his father's distaste for Teddy Roosevelt. Mm, That's a prank I'll have to try sometime. When he was eight or nine years old, Ted sold milk door to door. He inherited his father's curiosity and his mother's compassion. His mother, Nettie, loved animals, and not just traditionally cute animals. She kept a pet snake. Ever an entrepreneur, he used the proceeds from selling milk door-to-door to found a newspaper at his high school. With America's entry into World War I in 1917, the school's athletic coach was drafted. Gallup, captain of the football and baseball teams, offered to buy the team's uniforms. But he wanted something in return. He'd be officially named coach, and he would get to keep the ticket revenue. When Gallup went to college, he continued to found side businesses and take odd jobs to help pay for tuition. He pursued undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Iowa, Iowa City. It was there that he met his future wife, a French major and pianist named Ophelia Miller. Legend has it that they met through a poll. This story has Gallup asking his fellow students to name the prettiest girl at the school. Ophelia won the poll. Is that true? Or is that just the kind of thing they'd tell their kids? (laughs) Who knows? Does it matter? It's adorable. They married just after Christmas on December 27, 1925. He was 24 years old, and he was still pursuing his education. During one summer vacation, on one of his many odd jobs, Gallup worked for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He and his assistants took subscriber satisfaction surveys door-to-door. Gallup found the answers he received somewhat suspect. Respondents almost always said they read the global news, political news, and editorials. Almost no one said they read the comics. He started changing the questions to ask what people remembered from the most recent paper they'd read, thus getting around respondents' desire to appear respectable. Throughout his higher education, his passion for journalism continued to drive his decisions. He edited the Daily Iowan, a paper associated with the campus. Never content with having a reasonable number of pursuits, he also founded an honorary society for high school journalists in the fall of 1925. He called it the Quill and Scroll Society. He said he did it because he didn't want the athletes getting all the glory. Never mind that he was also an athlete. He kept himself so busy with his side pursuits that we still haven't even gotten to his actual coursework. From what we've already covered, you'd think he was a journalism student, but he was a psychology major. The university didn't have a journalism program until he was in graduate school. But today, University of Iowa's journalism school is named for him. 
His Ph.D. was in psychology from Iowa State University in 1928 when he was 26. His thesis was built on his time canvassing for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It proposed a method of measuring interest in newspaper content and ads by interviewing a representative sample of readers. In other words, a poll. Ultimately, what he wanted to understand, what he wanted to study, was people. Journalism, psychology, and polling, they all come back to that question. Who are people, and what do they want? And how can I profit from knowing the answer? Guys gotta eat. Not just him, he now had a family to provide for. In 1928, the same year he got his PhD, his first son, Alec, was born. Intent on providing for his young family, George briefly headed the journalism department at Drake University. He followed that with teaching gigs at Northwestern and Columbia. He didn't stay long in any of these positions, though he would later refer to education as his most pleasurable pursuit. During this time, in 1930, his second son was born and named George Gallup Jr. So there were a lot of Georges. It's odd that George Jr. is the younger son, isn't it? Well, Alec, the older son, was named after Alex Miller, Ophelia's father, who had died in 1927, just one year before Alec was born. Ah, that makes sense. Well, George Jr. was technically George Gallup III, but throughout his life, George Jr. chose to go by Jr. to emphasize his connection to his father. Because, as he said, that's the way I want it. By 1932, Gallup had a growing family, a great education, and a blossoming career. You'd think Gallup would have been satisfied staying in academia. But it wasn't until George left academia that he made his biggest contributions to the world. No, his impact didn't come from publishing papers or teaching pupils. It came when he moved to the big city of New York and joined Young and Rubicam. Young and Rubicam was an advertising agency. Gallup was employed as their director of research. His job was to determine what kinds of advertising worked and why. In advertising today, there is a saying of uncertain origin, the best advertising is not advertising. I'm sure most people in advertising think this is a new idea. Mm, It is not. What we now call content advertising, advertising which resembles the ordinary content published by a given publisher, was invented by Gallup. In 1931, he ran an ad for Grape Nuts in the comic section of newspapers designed to look like a comic. Grape Nut sales went through the roof. It's interesting, but I'm not sure how I feel about that. Well, it's understandable. It's a moral gray area. And today there is an ongoing, unsettled debate about how, and even whether, it can be done ethically. But the point is, he realized that readers' eyes tend to skip over advertisements and tune them out. But if you instead make ad content entertaining in and of itself, it pays off. Gallup's work in advertising shows his desire to understand human behavior, but he was not content to just spike the sales of grape nuts. There were bigger challenges on the horizon. Here's something we hope you will enjoy. 2018 is here, and it's time to turn your business idea into a reality. Get started by creating a website with Squarespace. With beautiful templates created by world-class designers, Squarespace makes it easy to turn your idea into a new and unique website. Showcase your work, publish content, or even sell products and services of all kinds in just a few clicks. You can customize everything from the look and feel to settings and products. It's all optimized for mobile right out of the box. Plus, use Squarespace's analytics to help you grow in real time. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade, ever. But if you do have a question, Squarespace's award-winning 24-7 customer support is there to help. A dream is just a great idea that doesn't have a website yet. Make it a reality with Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code HISTORICAL to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code HISTORICAL. Now let's get back to the story. George Gallup's next breakthrough started out with something much more personal than grape nuts. After several years of marriage to Ophelia, George Gallup must have noticed that his mother-in-law, Ola Miller, was not a traditional early 20th century Iowan woman. 
Not only had she sent her daughter to college in a time when that was uncommon, but she had political aspirations. That was unheard of. Ola did not set out to run for office, at least not at first, but she was involved in politics as an activist in the years leading up to 1926, when her husband, Alex, Ophelia's father, ran unsuccessfully for governor. Alex, you remember, died in 1927. Ola's own ambitions didn't die with Alex. She continued to work tirelessly as an activist in the Democratic Party. As a reward, in 1932, the party nominated her for Iowa Secretary of State. She was surprised when she found out she'd been nominated, and she certainly didn't expect to win. She accepted because, as she put it, it would have pleased Alex. The Democratic Party didn't expect her to win either. No Democrat or woman before her had ever been elected to serve as Iowa's Secretary of State. Nominating her may have just been an attempt to thank her. It's hard to overstate the challenge she faced. For one thing, her campaign was broke. Ophelia would later say of her mother, in no election did she spend more than $150, which was for gasoline so that she could ride around the countryside and meet the voters. Considered a long shot by every political observer, Ola could have just accepted the honor and given up on actually winning. Despite the uphill climb, Ola Miller doubled down and brought on her son-in-law, George Gallup, to do polling for her campaign. Given his thesis subject, George was the closest thing to a polling expert that existed at the time. Maybe he saw a political candidate as another product that could be sold to the public. Gallup polled Iowa voters and found that whatever the conventional wisdom said, his numbers showed Ola ahead. The campaign went as Gallup had predicted. Ola Miller became the first woman and first Democrat elected as Iowa's Secretary of State. She went on to win two re-elections, and George Gallup found his new love, the art and science of polling. And so, while still employed at Young and Rubicam, he founded the American Institute of Public Opinion in 1935 in Princeton, New Jersey. On October 20th, 1935, they printed their first release. To make room for this new second job, he quit his old second job, which had been teaching journalism at Columbia University. I'm actually surprised he didn't try to do all three. He probably had enough going on with the challenges of raising his family. His daughter, Julia, was born in the late 1930s. At the American Institute of Public Opinion, he did the work for which he is most famous, streamlining and standardizing a polling methodology that, from a limited sample size, would reflect the feelings of a broad population. It's strange to think of a time before polling. It's so ingrained into our daily news cycle. Freshly updated approval ratings and election predictions get tossed around every day. But really, try to imagine such a time. There are no tracking polls, no predictions, no surveys showing how Americans feel about specific issues. If you're a politician, how do you know what your constituents want? Well, you don't. Then how do you represent them? Mm, Poorly. (laughs) Touché. Before polling, the only way politicians could hear from their constituents was through telegrams or town halls, both of which select for the loudest voices in a given population. Gallup liked to point out that telegrams couldn't be trusted. Once, to kill a bill that would have hurt their business, private utility employees copied names out of phone books to forge on protesting telegrams. Congress got the idea that the massed public was against the bill. It was killed. Yeah, and even under the best of circumstances, telegrams were never going to be a representative sample. But that's all they had to go by. What was the alternative? Listening to their gut, or lobbyists. So, passing laws is hard enough, but what about running for office? Today, every candidate for Senate on up employs a pollster. They tell the candidate where to campaign and what to campaign on. They tell the candidate what issues matter. What is the common man thinking? The life history of democracy can be traced as an unceasing search for an answer to this vital question. The following pages provide a modern answer on the basis, not of guesswork, but of facts. This is how Gallup began his seminal 1940 book, The Pulse of Democracy, The Public Opinion Poll and How It Works. It is a hefty volume, filled as much with political philosophy as polling methodology. There were organizations that attempted to conduct polls before Gallup, but they were rudimentary and unscientific. Various entities had tried, some of them expending tremendous money and effort, especially in politics. 
Gallup discussed these with no small amount of respect for what they had attempted. He saw himself as building off of their legacy. For example, some newspapers had made a habit of sending reporters to Canvas to ask about the voting intentions of the common man, but the reporters were simply trusted to find voters they thought were typical. Gallup appreciated their get-up-and-go attitude, but expected more from a methodology than that. In polling, pre-Gallup, the heavy weight in the ring was the Literary Digest. This newspaper would print a ballot in their paper to be mailed back to them. In 1928, they received a shocking 18 million ballots, 63.2% for Hoover, who won the actual election by 58.8% considered prescient, almost eerily so, by the standards of the time. Yeah, and in 1936, they called the election for Landon 54 percent, but Roosevelt won with 62.5 percent. Oh, whoa. What happened? Mm -hmm. The Digest never had a working methodology. They had gotten their earlier predictions more or less correct due to dumb luck. Well, sample sizes of 18 million are unheard of in modern polling or in Gallup's polls, which are usually based on hundreds or maybe thousands of respondents. But Gallup had gotten better results than the Literary Digest with fewer people. He described how he did it like this. By sounding the opinions of a relatively small number of persons, proportionate to each major population group in every section of the country, the opinions of the whole population can be determined with a high degree of accuracy. And he sounds like a visionary. But he wrote this in 1940, just one election cycle after the Literary Digest humiliated itself. Gallup's own humbling was yet to come. In 1936, Gallup saw the Literary Digest misfire coming. He knew why their methodology wouldn't work, and he could prove it. He conducted a poll where he deliberately skewed his sample to match the Digest sample, predicting what the Digest would predict. This prediction was also correct. Gallup had now predicted both the actual outcome of the election and also the way in which his competitors would get it wrong, and he'd done it with much smaller samples. He said the Digest had made their mistake not because of malice, but because of their flawed sampling methods. The Digest samples were huge, but Gallup showed the world that what's most important is that the sample is representative of the larger whole. In the late 30s and early 40s, when Gallup began practicing his craft, Fascism was on the rise in Europe, and substantial forces advocated for America to go the same way. When the shadow of war fell across Europe in late August 1939, an instrument was in readiness to test America's attitudes and reactions. Without polling, nobody could have been sure how many Americans sympathized with fascists, or how many supported intervention in the war on behalf of the Allies. Because of Gallup's polls, it was a known fact how many Americans supported intervention. Gallup contrasted this with America's deliberations about entering the First World War decades earlier, when no one knew how many Americans supported intervention. Even before the outbreak of hostilities in the late 1930s, selected interviewers in every state had received ballots especially designed to test public opinion objectively. In 1917, it was necessary to rely on impression and speculation to assess the reactions of public opinion. So to Gallup, writing this book in 1940, polling was a moral imperative. Not only have the polls demonstrated that public opinion can be measured, there is a growing conviction that public opinion must be measured. What the mass of the people think puts governments in and out of office, starts and stops wars, sets the tone of morality, makes and breaks heroes. Wow, I gotta be honest, that's not what I was expecting out of a book about polling. What did you expect? I don't know, charts, numbers? Well, there are dozens of pages of raw, unfiltered poll results in the appendix. Uh, you wanna read those aloud for us? Uh, I'll pass. Today, polls are conducted mostly by telephone, but that wasn't possible in Gallup's day. Even as late as 1960, more than 40% of American homes did not have a telephone. Worse, households with phones were not representative of America at large. It was worse in the South, with Mississippi at a whopping 55% of households without telephones in 1960. So, telephones as a survey method in 1940 were out of the question. What's that leave him with? Did he have to pull into everyone's driveway and ask them himself? Well, yes. Or pay others to do it. Field agents were known to drive through a main snowstorm to make a farm interview. 
to trudge across Kansas wheat fields on a blistering day, to interview a thresher on the job, to travel through the red clay mud of Georgia in a drenching rainstorm. Basically, each field agent had to prevail in their own personal high fantasy adventure quest. Did the difficulty of long journeys bias the polls toward people who were easy to reach? Suburbanites in welcoming houses rather than remote homesteads or inner city apartments? It probably did introduce some bias, but Gallup was aware of it and worked hard to compensate for it. The agents talked to the prominent industrialist who runs a huge factory employing thousands of employees, just as they talked to the old lady who silently mops his office when everyone else has gone home. For a man of his time, acknowledging class bias seems somewhat surprising. Mm, that makes sense. But from the start, he made sure women and minorities were represented in his polls, like they were in the larger population. Sure, credit where it's due. But is this forward thinking or just the best way to get a useful sample? Well, he surveyed diverse communities in a time when his competitors took the easy way out. So there is that. But he was a white man in the early 20th century. Meaning most of his collaborators were other white men. Yeah. However, he was still an idealist when it came to the mechanisms of democracy. Gallup was aware that he was inventing a tool, and like any tool, it can be turned into a weapon. We know that proponents of democracy think public opinion is important because continuous efforts have been made throughout the history of popular government to improve and clarify its expression. We know, too, that autocrats think public opinion is important because they devote vast sums and careful attention to curbing and controlling it. So clearly Gallup believed in what he was selling. But let's not lose sight of the fact that he was selling it. That's right. Like the milk from his father's dairy farm or the political prospects of his mother-in-law or grape nuts, polling was a product and Gallup was a marketer. It was not long before more industries took notice, including even Hollywood. As with politics, George Gallup found Hollywood an industry ripe for disruption. For decades, studio decision makers had relied on intuition to choose and market their films. In addition to their intuition, they had other unreliable tools available to them. Fan mail, reviews in industry trades, and so on. As in politics, attempts were occasionally made to formally measure public opinion before the 1940s, but they were rare and lacked scientific rigor. So how was Hollywood to know what audiences really wanted? The modern test audience is another Gallup innovation. The test audience is brought in to see the movie early, before it has been completed, and is given a detailed survey at the end. Which parts of the film worked for them, which parts didn't. Each survey is submitted with demographic information, so the sample can be extrapolated to draw conclusions about the movie-going population at large. By the time the 1940s were over, Gallup's Audience Research Institute had conducted thousands of surveys for over a dozen entertainment industry clients. Hmm. Anyone I've heard of? Yeah, nobody big, just Walt Disney, Sam Goldwyn, little films like Gone with the Wind. Mm, name dropper. The film Best Years of Our Lives was one of the most thoroughly researched in history. Gallup's star was on the rise when it won nine Oscars and was nominated for one more. Now, by no means was Gallup's research perfect. He did not have a magic mirror that told him which stars with which script would be a success. As with everywhere he went, though, he built a solid foundation. He hoped future generations would be able to build on what he started. Hollywood was changed forever. Of course, many executives would continue to go with their gut. But even if an executive made a gut-feeling decision, in post-Gallup Hollywood, they would have to justify their decision to their bosses and shareholders using numbers. In 1944, Gallup published his second book, A Guide to Public Opinion Polls, which was also on the topic of, well, polling. Polling had become ubiquitous in America in just a few short years. Gallup was still the same man who, as a boy, had founded a newspaper and bought the job of coaching the football team. He couldn't seem to stop founding businesses. In 1947, his new fad was the Gallup International Association. In 1948, he followed it up with Gallup Robinson Incorporated, which was focused on advertising research. 1948 brings us to Gallup's most famous polls. Dewey defeats Truman. Gallup, riding high on decades of success in advertising, then politics, and even his sojourn in Hollywood, was regarded as the greatest pollster in history. 
He was so well known by 1948 that his polls were sometimes just called a gallop, omitting the word pole, like a Kleenex instead of a Kleenex tissue. Wow, now that is brand recognition. Mm -hmm. So when two of Gallup's October polls predicted that Thomas Dewey would win the election, the Chicago Daily Tribune took it as a done deal. Besides, a print deadline loomed. If they wanted their papers to be ready to serve when people wanted to read the results, they had to go to print. Of course, as we know today, Dewey lost 45.1% to 49.6%. That's why Truman looks so happy in the picture where he's holding up the paper announcing his loss. The victorious Truman said of the headline, That ain't the way I heard it. Dewey defeats Truman was widely regarded as an egg-on-your-face moment for polling as a general concept and for Gallup personally. If the 1936 polls gave the fledgling industry considerable credibility with the U.S. public, their performance in the 1948 election threatened to undo everything. But Gallup refused to give up. As long as public opinion is important in this country, and until someone finds a better way of appraising it, I intend to go right ahead with the task of reporting the opinions of the people on the issues vital to their welfare. Gallup, whose work in many industries was client-based, suddenly found it harder to acquire new clients. His work in Hollywood slowed down noticeably. Gallup had built a career on being fashionable, and now he wasn't. Though the moment has the reputation of being a catastrophic misfire, and even George seems to have thought it was, maybe that's overstating his mistake. Well, for one thing, the election had been close, closer than the ones in which Gallup's polls had typically been reliable. Gallup's polls had also shown a close race. He'd only conducted two polls in October, the month before the election. They showed Dewey ahead by five points. That sounds fairly tight. Why would that inspire such confidence? Remember how seriously he was taken? A poll at that time could simply be called a gallop. Mm, Too famous for his own good. Mm, And Gallup hadn't been alone in getting it wrong. The other pollsters had too. Plus, the Chicago Daily Tribune trusted its Washington correspondent, Arthur Sears Henning, who consulted his gut and decided Dewey was his man. Gut feeling, as we've learned, isn't exactly reliable. When the night's earliest election returns also agreed with the polls and with Henning, the article went to print. But as the night went on, results started coming in that contradicted Henning's prediction. If he had been a data man like Gallup, he might have corrected his assumption. Instead, he stuck with his gut. And the papers kept going out with the wrong headline. So was Dewey defeats Truman really a condemnation of polling as an idea? Maybe it was a condemnation of putting too much faith in a few polls. See, in Gallup's 1940 book, he goes out of his way to discuss the limits of his knowledge. He was just building a foundation, not the entire pyramid. He had written, It is not the purpose of this book to present a final and definitive statement of the uses and value of public opinion polls. Just out of their swaddling clothes with their future development subject to shifts and adjustments, public opinion polls will require new evaluations in the years ahead. So the last person who would have expressed total confidence in Gallup's numbers was Gallup himself. The polls are charting unmapped territory. These are pages from a notebook of exploration. Maybe his lofty language disguised his modesty. Gallup hadn't claimed to have all the answers. It didn't help that Gallup's most recent poll was two weeks before the election. A lot can happen in two weeks. Now, that is his mistake. If you look at the change in polls over time, they showed a tightening race. He should have noticed that and conducted more polls. But though today looking at the changes in poll results is common, we even have a fancy term for it, trend line analysis, most analysis of polls in 1948 consisted of glancing at the final numbers and seeing which one was bigger. Since 1948, the biggest change hasn't been to polling itself, but what we do with the polls when we're done. Today, we analyze and aggregate. Gallup apparently didn't do that. His poll showed Dewey ahead, so Dewey, he concluded, would probably win. Remember, Gallup's early polls were accurate in comparison to what came before. We've continued to build on his methods, so his early polls aren't as good as today's. He'd actually probably be pretty happy about that. Yeah, and even today's polls miss, sometimes almost as infamously as Dewey defeats Truman. Mm -hmm. So even giving Gallup the benefit of the doubt, the photograph of Truman holding Dewey defeats Truman took a while for Gallup to live down. Gallup processed this defeat exactly how you'd expect. 
He conducted polling. He did. <laughs> At the time, most politicians and political observers believed in what was called Farley's Law. James Farley, after whom it's named, had been FDR's campaign manager in 1932 and 1936. His ideas carried heft. Farley's Law stated that all voters have made up their minds by the summer. So much for that. Gallup's post-election polls showed that one in seven voters, or 6,927,000 people, made up their minds in the last two weeks before the election. And Truman had won 75% of the late deciders. Gallup realized his biggest mistake was probably believing in Farley's law without evidence backing it up. Well, at least when Gallup was wrong, he learned from it. Mm. One thing that could have helped Gallup would have been a long legacy of polling data. He knew this. He wished he had that data, from which he could have drawn so many useful conclusions. A decades-long data archive could have shown, for instance, people are still making up their minds two weeks before an election and other fun things. It is not too hopeful to suggest that the continuous collection of facts about public opinion will provide the theorists of the future with a solid groundwork on which to base a realistic theory of public opinion as it actually works in everyday life. He set out to build the data set he wished he had, a sprawling collection which he knew he could never live to see completed, destined to be the first pair of boots on new shores. So that's why the end of his 1940 book was full of all those numbers. Exactly. That was what he saw as his legacy, an ever-expanding archive of the things the common person believed and how those beliefs changed over the years. In 1958, when Gallup was 57 years old, he finally combined all of his various polling enterprises into a new organization called, simply, the Gallup Organization. And if George himself wasn't going to be around to see the dawn of data he envisioned, then that honor fell to his successors, who turned out to be his sons. George Jr. contemplated becoming a priest, but fate had other plans. He began working for his father in 1954. And Alec, who had attended the University of Iowa like his father, went on a similar trajectory, studying advertising research and journalism. He joined his brother and father at the Gallup organization in 1959. With its long-standing international focus, the Gallup organization came to boast of affiliates in 35 nations across the globe. Dewey defeats Truman was well in the rearview mirror. At the same time, another organization of Gallup's was also expanding. Alec, George Jr., and Julia all found partners and started families of their own in the late 50s. In 1964, Gallup published his third book, The Miracle Ahead. What miracle did he think was in store for the world of polling? Well, actually, this book was about education, and unlike his 1940 book, it was aimed at a general audience. Man has been inexplicably slow in recognizing the greatness of his brain. At the same time, there is no need to decry man's current progress. All the perennial doom and gloom about how today's generation of kids is the worst? George was not here for that. Ever the optimist about human nature, he believed education was due for a revolution. He wrote, There is good reason to believe that mankind can make another great forward stride through the use of his mental powers. He believed this great forward stride would come from an education system that taught perception, concentration, problem solving, and decision making. Remember that, until recently, much of American education was focused on rote memorization and regurgitation of facts. That's why we still call some college classes recitations. Gallup believed that more modern methods would bring about what he described as wisdom as opposed to knowledge. His fourth and final book was published in 1972, The Sophisticated Poll Watcher's Guide. Unlike his other books, this book was written without a thesis statement. Instead, he asked journalists, politicians, editors, commentators, political science professors, and others to submit questions about polls and how they worked. Aimed again at a general audience, he avoided polling jargon in this book, going so far as to omit questions that were highly technical. Always a teacher, he hoped this book would give journalists the skills necessary to correctly interpret polls. Remember that one of the problems in Dewey Defeats Truman was journalists' overconfidence in the Gallup name. 
This book was an attempted solution to that problem. If journalists knew how to analyze polls, maybe they would be able to better describe their limitations. Though business had taken Gallup to Hollywood and carried his name to companies across the globe, the Gallup family stayed close. Even by 1973, when there were three Gallup children, each with a spouse and five total Gallup grandchildren, the whole clan still gathered together every Thanksgiving in Princeton, New Jersey to enjoy Ophelia's cooking. When George was 80, in 1982, he told an interviewer, One of the most interesting polls we ever did was about aging. People who aged most gracefully were those who took life as it comes. Wait, but he did the opposite of that. For most of his life, sure. But by 1982, though he was still involved in his business, he had started to relax. It's never too late to learn from the data. George Gallup died of a heart attack on July 27, 1984, at his summer home in Switzerland. He was 82. Ophelia and his three children buried him at Princeton Cemetery. After he died, Alec and George Jr. served as co-chairman of the company that bore their name. Alec aggressively sued to try to prevent the name Gallup from becoming a genericized trademark. He wanted it to be a brand, not a word for any poll, whether conducted by Gallup or not. Alec's attempt, though occasionally successful, mostly failed. For example, in Finland, Gallup is literally the word for poll. And since nobody loved contemplating George Gallup's legacy more than George Gallup, we're going to let him get the last word in. Throughout the history of politics, this central problem has remained. Shall the common people be free to express their basic needs and purposes, or shall they be dominated by a small ruling clique? The attitudes of the mass of the people determine policy. With public opinion on its side, said Abraham Lincoln in the course of his famous contest with Douglas, everything succeeds. With public opinion against it, nothing succeeds. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Historical Figures. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Historical Figures, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode drops every Wednesday, but if you subscribe, you don't have to remember that. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. As always, we thank you for listening. Historical Figures was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Kenny Hobbs with production assistance by Carrie Murphy. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Historical Figures is written by Tom Pike and stars Vanessa Richardson and Carter Roy. Our amazing voice actor is Mike Capozzi.